Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. He remembers his covenant covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as a proportion you will inherit. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to be here today. Good to see all of you today. Um, Please bring prayer for for Pastor Troy and his family. They are off enjoying their vacation, seeing some family. Uh, We'll just be praying for them to have some safe travels as they start heading back this coming week. Um, But in the meantime, you're stuck with me, so sorry about that. (laughs) Uh, If you don't know who I am, my name is Andrew Wheeler. I'm the youth pastor here. And um, we are going to continue on in our series this morning um, through Genesis. We've been going through the book of Genesis, and we're going to continue on right through that. So if you guys want to open up to Genesis chapter 13, that is where we are going to be this morning. My question for you guys this morning to start us off is, why, why do we love stories? If you want to take a moment to think about that. Maybe you have some answers right off the top of your head of like, well, they're captivating. They are intriguing. Stories um, are entertaining. Or they, we're able to connect with what they're saying to us. There's, there's a lot of different reasons, right? We love stories for a variety of different ways. But why is it that we use them all the time? Why don't we only just deal in straight facts or um, information with no color or no character? Why do we tell each other stories? Why do we um, watch stories in the form of television or or read stories in in books? Why do we continue to come back to them over and over? I believe fundamentally that there is great power in words. There's power in words. We see that all around us. Uh, Not just the words themselves, but even in the combination of those words to make stories, right? Words have power to encourage. Words have power to enrage, to build up, to beat down. Words have been used in the past to create empires and to start wars. With words, you can make oaths. With words, you can make promises. Or you can betray and slander people. The Bible tells us that it's even God's word that created the universe, that created everything that we see through the power of the word. We love stories because those words, those combinations of words fit together in a beautiful and intelligent way. They connect us to one another. They connect us to uh, each other in this room, people that we know, but also people we don't know, people around the world, because we have shared experiences that we tell each other in the form of stories. They inspire us. They can also cause us to think about difficult subjects. And they also move us to act in ways that we may not otherwise In stories, there's lots of things to appreciate, but if you notice, if you look through stories, all of us kind of, as we we grow to to read and to understand what people say and to understand stories better, we see throughout stories that there's always central themes, central ideas that are coming out, right? There's, maybe there's a theme of loyalty or a theme of uh, hard work or a theme of diligence or discipline or a theme of, of love or friendship, Authors choose different things to, that they wanted to emphasize in their stories and they want to emphasize in what they're telling. As the audience, it is uh, to truly understand the story as we're reading it, as we're hearing it or listening to it, it's imperative to us, it's, it's necessary for us to actually understand the core theme of what the author is trying to get at, what the author is trying to show in their message, show in this story. What's the theme underlying all of it? For scripture, this is more vital than anywhere else, right? I mean, this is our very life that we're talking about here. It's vital for us to understand the core themes that are in this book, the core themes that run through it all, that shape it, that mold it, that that teach us the lessons that we know today. It's vital for us to know those things. We can understand the good news about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, 
um, his perfect life, his glorious resurrection. We can understand the good news without understanding all of the central themes that the Bible talks about. But the better we know them, the better we come to learn them, the better we devote ourselves to studying them, to understanding what they are, the better that we understand not only ourselves and our position in regards to God, but the better we understand God himself by studying his word, by understanding what these themes actually are. Today, we're going to be examining one of those themes. It's one of the central themes that runs throughout scripture that binds a lot of pieces together, that moves the story along, that helps shape all of the events that we see come out of of the Bible. And that theme is covenant. Covenant is an interesting word that we don't really use today, but it's, it's an oral agreement. It's an agreement between parties that's even more significant than an oath. Um, it's like um, more significant than a treaty or uh, a treatise between two parties. It is an agreement that people come to and has terrible consequences if broken. And there are several covenants that we understand and we see throughout scripture. They're a special breed of theme because where there are other themes throughout scripture that we look at, like the love of God or uh, grace or salvation, there's a lot of themes that are based on action throughout scripture, but covenants are different because they're based on words. They're based on words that bind people together in such a way that breaking those is deeply impactful. Covenants are powerful enough to transcend lifetimes and generations as we see throughout scripture. They are milestones that guide us through the story and they remind us of what's happened and they remind us to what, for what to look for in the future. But the question remains, as we look at these covenants, as we examine them throughout scripture, are covenants powerful enough? Are covenants powerful enough to overcome yesterday's sins? Are covenants powerful enough to overcome yesterday's sins and powerful enough to overcome the damage, the, to avoid the dangers of future problems? Are covenants powerful enough? That's what we want to look at today. So let's start in Genesis chapter 13. We're going to read through it, all of it, um, but we're going to start with just the first seven verses. In them, Genesis 13, starting verse 1, it says, So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Life's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Okay. As we are looking at Genesis, as we have been moving through, we have been slowly uh, but surely narrowing down our scope in these first 12 chapters, now on to chapter 13. We started with the broad, super broad scope of creation, right? God created the entire universe, everything that we know and we see and things that we don't see, God created it all. So we start off with the broadest perspective that you could possibly get. And then we narrow into Adam and Eve and their story. And how Adam and Eve are deeply impactful for all of humanity. And then it widens back out again to see uh, the scope and the, the damages done to all of humanity by talking about uh, Noah and the flood. I mean, Cain and Abel first, and then also the, the Noah and the flood, and how the, the damage has been done with sin on a worldwide scale, and what the, what the effects of that sin are. And then beyond the flood, even when it seems like there might be hope again in the future, we see generations later after Noah and his family, that uh, things are right back to where they were. People are still evil. Sin is still a thing. And it is still affecting everybody deeply, right? And we see that people come together and they want to replace God. They want to be equal with God. So they build the Tower of Babel and they come together and try to reach up to the heavens. 
and God scatters them again. And after that, he says, okay, I'm, I'm done working with all of humanity all at once. I'm going to choose to focus on one family in particular. And he chooses Abraham. And he chooses Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Here still known as Abram and Sarai. And that is where the scope narrows, right? And right at that point, we see God uh, act and move in Abram's life. Even though he didn't deserve it, it doesn't say, like, even like it did with Noah, that Noah was a righteous man. It doesn't even say that of Abraham. It just says that the Lord came to him and he said to him, this is from Genesis 12, it says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and in, in him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He chooses Abraham. Out of his own will, out of his own volition, God comes up to Abraham and he says, you are going to be the one that I'm going to work through now. Right? I'm going to invest my life into you. I'm going to uh, invest my time and my, covenant, my covenantal promise in your family. Okay? There is still hope for redemption for all of humanity. But right now, God is choosing to work that out and work that through the life and the family of Abraham. And that is where we're picking up our story. But we see right away that Abraham, just like all of humanity, this is what we talked about last week, he, he fails immediately, right? He doesn't trust in God's promise. And when famine comes, when hard times come upon Abraham, Abraham he decides to go to Egypt, right? He doesn't listen to God. He doesn't consult God. He doesn't trust in the promise that God is going to bless him. He just decides to achieve it on his own, to achieve his blessing for himself. And he goes down to Egypt and he stays there and he even lies there about who his wife is. Says that Sarah is his sister instead of his wife. So that things will go well with him. He's trying to achieve his blessing on his own. And things do not go so well for him. <laughs> There's a lot of things that happen in Egypt. And he ends up being kicked out with his whole family. Uh, completely disgraced by the Egyptians. And he has to head on back to where he came from. And we're left wondering, after chapter 12 is done, what is the outcome of all of this? God, out of his own will, chose Abraham through his family to, to bless the entire world, to be a blessing to people, to help his name grow, to help his, uh, his family become great. And immediately, Abraham goes against that promise. Immediately, Abraham decides not to trust in what God has given him and go his own way. So where, where does that leave us? Where does that leave Abraham? Is God's covenant powerful enough to overcome Abraham's sins? That's the question that Genesis 13 is trying to answer. And so far, it's not looking so good, right? As we just read these first seven verses, uh, he, came, he comes back from Egypt, and he goes back to the place where he settled in the beginning, and he goes to consult God. He goes to call upon God's name, uh, but nothing is really happening. All of a sudden, there's a bunch of conflict in his family. There's not enough space for him to live, and things are not going so well. It doesn't even say that the famine was over in Canaan. So now he's left with more people to care for, more livestock to care for because of uh, what happened in Egypt, and there's still a famine going on. How is he going to get out of this? What is going to happen in this story? The author makes sure that we know the attitude of Abram, though. We know that Abram is, has learned his lesson in Egypt. We know that he is repenting of his sins. He is coming back, not only just to the land that God had showed him in the beginning, but to the very place where he had first built the altar to God, where God gave him the promise, and he built an altar to celebrate God and to worship God there. And Abram goes back to that very place to worship God again and to call upon the name of the Lord. The author wants us to know that, yeah, Abram is very sorry for what he's done. He's very repentant for his actions, for not trusting in the Lord, for not following what God wanted him to do. But it's interesting because um, we don't really hear an answer right away. But it is an awesome example for us, right? We see uh, what God is doing in Abram's life and we see uh, 
even though he has gone through, uh, gone through Egypt and made those mistakes, he comes back and he still repents of all these things. He messed up disastrously, disastrously and he still turned everything around and went back to God because he knew what, we did, what he did was wrong. He knew that he had offended God. And he knew it was best and right to go back to him and to apologize and to repent of his sins and call out to him. What a great example for us. Even regardless of what, what the rest of the story tells us, this is a good example for us. That we can, no matter what yesterday's sins are, no matter what has happened in our past, we can come to God always because that's what's best and right, to repent of those and to turn to him and call upon him. But luckily, the story doesn't end there because that would be pretty depressing. That would be a pretty sad way to end that there's just this conflict and there's no response from God for what Abram had to say. I think it's interesting that we don't hear any response from God. Abram calls out to him and he seems to have done everything right based on what we see in the rest of scripture. Uh, Abram seems to have repented of his sins to literally physically take the language of repentance of turning completely around and doing that in his life by physically going out of Egypt and going all the way back to where he was at the beginning. He seems to have been doing the right things. So why don't we hear any response from God? It's interesting. What could this mean? Again, we come back to this question. Has the covenant been damaged too much? Is Abram now out of favor with God? I mean, if we've been paying attention or if we have read this story before, um, we know that this is not where it's going to end. We, we can see that there's more to this chapter, obviously, and there's more to this book, a whole lot more. So we know that the story is not ending here. But we want to make sure that we understand what the author is doing here. We want to make sure that we understand that the author is taking us on a journey, okay? The author is taking us on a journey of what God is doing in Abram's life and how Abram is responding to those things and why that's important. This is, this is the effect that stories have. They cause us to think and they cause us to look more deeply about what life actually is about and how messy it can be sometimes. So the author is taking us on a journey that causes some doubt to creep in for what we know God has already promised. He lets the doubt creep in because he wants it to. He wants us to actually think about this question Can God's covenants overcome our sins? Can God's covenants overcome the dangers that we put it in? So to ensure that we're paying attention, to ensure that uh, he draws out our own doubts, the author pulls and focuses on the negative. He pulls and focuses on the strife, the conflict, the sin. He points back to those things. And he purposefully... uh, lets us know that Abram called upon the name of the Lord and then doesn't have any sort of immediate answer. He wants us to ask this question of ourselves. But I think this is a really good effect of the power of story. Can you imagine if this was just information, like a list of facts? Here's fact number one. God promised Abraham something. Here's fact number two. Abraham didn't believe that promise. Here's fact number three. Abraham tried to achieve it on his own. Here's fact number four. Abraham failed at that and tried to repent, and God didn't answer. Here's fact number five. Now there's conflict in Abraham's family. Can you imagine if, if, that's, if that's what this book was like? If there was just a list of facts of how history has gone on, more like bullet points of, of highlights for what has happened. We wouldn't be asking this question of ourselves here today. We wouldn't be looking at the significance of Abraham's actions We would just be reading it and ingesting information. But as a story, now we have something that we can invest our lives in. Now we are curious about how it unfolds. Now, by understanding what brought Abraham to this point, we should be devastated. We should be worried. We should be worried that, like God has done twice now, that he's going to reset the world again. Because what have we seen up to this point? The, the people of the world start to sin and their sin becomes too great and God doesn't want to look at it so he sends a flood to wipe out everybody but one family. What do we see after that? 
the people of the world are still sinful, and they still want to replace God. They still want to do things on their own. So God, instead of sending a flood to wipe them all out, he confuses their language and divides the people and sends them scattered across the world. Now we come to another point where it's even just focused on one family, but this one family can't get it right. This one family can't live, to live up to God's standard and trust in his promise enough to do what he says. So what should we expect? We should expect God to do another reset, to choose a new family. That's what we should be expecting. And that's the, what the question becomes. Are yesterday's sins enough to topple God's covenant? See, Abraham is still feeling the mistakes that he made in Egypt and the mistakes he made along the way. He became super wealthy when he went down to Egypt because he said that Sarai was his sister and not his, his wife. And so when Pharaoh wanted to take Sarai as, to be his wife, he had to pay a dowry. He had to pay a bride price for her. And that's how Abraham got all of his cattle, all of his livestock, all of, even some of his people. Some, some uh, theologians think that's where Hagar came into the picture. And as we'll, we're going to look at their story later on. And what kind of impact that had in Abram's life. Because of that decision to go down to Egypt and that following decision to lie about who Sarai was, um, Abraham was blessed materially, but now he's feeling the impact of that. Because guess what? He goes back to where he was at before and there's no more room for him. And there's still a famine in the land. He still has to provide for all these people, for all this livestock. So what's he going to do? Due to his wealth, now there's strife in the camp. With Lot and their herdsmen, there's not enough room. It's interesting to think about how Lot and the herdsmen also would have reacted to this whole situation. Lot went with him throughout it all. Lot was with him before they went down to Egypt and all the way down to Egypt and all the way back. You have to wonder, did Lot start to lose respect for his uncle? Did some of the other herdsmen start to lose respect for Abram's decision making? Do they think that they uh, should go out on their own already because it would be better for them? These are the seeds of strife that show themselves in chapter 13. Before we continue, let's kind of remind ourselves where this is all headed so far. If you can see on this map, this shows the entire story or the entire journey of Abraham. He started uh, way over in Ur and he went all the way up with his family to Haran and came down all the way into Canaan. And he settled in Shechem. And that's where God gave his promise to Abraham. He came down all the way through here. And there's, it's hard to see, but there's a few other dots around this area. Um, this is Bethel and Ai, where, where God gave him the promise, or where, where Abram built the altar to celebrate God's promise to him in, in the land that God had given him. Then he makes his decision to go down to Egypt and he has a bad time there. So he comes on back right to where he was before. Right to where he was before in Bethel and Ai. That's where it's at, right? Um, just west of the Dead Sea. And that is where he's settling. And right now it says that there's the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelling in the land. So he probably had to go to some specific locations because Canaanites and Perizzites would have been all over, spread across uh, the land of Canaan and dwelling there and uh, making it so, I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't just settle anywhere in the land. He had to choose specific places because uh, probably most of the good places were taken, especially while he was in Egypt and had that detour there. Some people kind of probably moved in to where he was before, could have lost some of his, his claim on the land. But this time, though, even though uh, he had that detour in Egypt, he remembers, Abram remembers where he encountered God in the beginning and goes back to reorient his mindset, to reorient his priorities, and to repent of his faithlessness. He goes back to the altar and he calls upon the name of the Lord. But though Abram repented of his sins, he still needed to deal with these consequences. He still needed to deal with the sins of what he had just done. And the embodiment of those sins really doesn't come down to Sarah or, or the livestock or the things that he had gained, but it all starts with Lot. 
And that's, that's where he, he actually really turned and the part of the consequences that he needs to deal with. If we remember from chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. He calls Abram to leave his family, to separate himself, him and Sarai, from his family and to go out to where God is calling him. But what does it say right after the promise? So Abram went, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. That's not part of the promise. That's not part of what God's direction to him was. So right from the very beginning, we see Abram was messing up and not doing what God wanted him to do. And he has to deal with those consequences now. He has to deal with the consequences of what Egypt brought him. He has to deal with uh, maybe most likely strife in his marriage too from what his decisions in Egypt brought him. There's consequences to the actions of Abram and he has to, he has to deal with them. And we see that all coming to a head in verses five through seven when Lot, uh, who went with Abram, Uh, who also had flocks and herds and tents, who also became wealthy because of uh, their journey down into Egypt by sort of a side effect. Um, The land couldn't couldn't support both of them. So there started to be growing pains of their relationship. And like we said, there could have also been a lot of strife in the relationship already because of disrespect now and distrust of Abram's leadership and Abram's ability to, to provide um, and so there's a lot of strife between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abram, and it's coming to a head. There's no more room for them to dwell, and everything seems to be falling apart. It seems that the sins of the past are doomed to repeat themselves, that history is now coming into this terrible cycle of God trying to intervene and trying to work with humanity and humanity continuing to mess it up over and over again and he has to choose new people over and over again. And God's covenant seems to have been made irreparable, beyond repair. But let's continue. Let's see where this story is going to take us. Starting in verse 8, it says, Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Adam and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. And Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. If we've been paying attention, uh, we would see that things kind of spiral out of control more and more, and things take terrible turns when we have seen in the past that it describes things starting to unravel and humanity starting to take this downward turn. But here we see a surprising turn, a surprising twist in Abram's story. Abram's the patriarch of the family. He's the more wealthy of the two, uh, two leaders of this family. He's the one in charge of the direction and the settlement thus far. He's made all the decisions for where the family should go, what they should do, where they should settle. Yet here we see him coming to Lot the lesser of the two, if you will, and addressing the situation and allowing Lot to take whichever land he likes, allowing Lot to make the decision, allowing Lot to be the one in charge, leaving Abram with whatever's left. Now, we would expect Abram as the patriarch to take the land that he wants for himself, especially as we see in verse 10, the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Clearly, there's one section of land, as we're looking down at the map, there's one section off to the east that is more beneficial, that is better looking than the rest of the land. It's more well watered, it is uh, more plentiful, it's good for the livestock, there's uh, civilization there. And we see that Abram gives up this right to choose. 
He has the right to decide, but he decides not to do it. We see here, and we begin to glimpse the great faith that Abram has. We hear so much about it later in the Bible, that Abram had faith in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. New Testament authors talk about Abraham all the time as the father of faith, as our spiritual father, even as believers, because of uh, his, his trust in God. So far, we haven't seen it. Chapter 12 didn't show us any faith from Abraham. But it seems he learned his lesson, and now the story takes a turn. Because instead of going upon, taking it upon himself to achieve the blessing, taking it upon himself to uh, see to fulfillment what God had promised him, he gives it up. He gives up the right to choose. And he says, I'm, God, I'm leaving it in your hands. I'm leaving it for you to decide. I'm leaving it for you to take care of me because you promised me. So now I'm going to allow you to work. He lets Lot decide, and he decides to be okay with what's left over. He knows that one section of the land looks better. He knows that he has a family to feed. He has livestock to take care of. Yet, he shows his faith. He did not allow fear and selfishness to guide his decisions. He did not allow his, his need for uh, control or his need for uh, fulfilling his own promise to, to guide his decision-making. He trusted on the Lord. He called upon the Lord and decides to let God do the providing. And we see that Abram has this great journey of faith from here and becomes the father of faith for all of us, becomes the one who we have an example for who, who began this promise, who was able to uh, be used by God because of the faith that he had in him. Let me just say for a moment outside of the story, uh, can we just evaluate for a second how we are making our decisions? How are we making our decisions in our life? Right now we see this contrast between Lot and Abram. Lot looks and he sees that there's a great section of land that's better suited for people, better suited for livestock. And he reaches out and he takes it. Goes on the road of uh, self-advancement. Goes on the road of taking it into his own hands and just looking at what the world says is good. On, on the contrary, we see Abram, who decides to live by faith, who decides to trust in the promise of God. Do we do that? <laughs> do we immediately chase after every opportunity in front of us? Do we take advantage of everything that seems to look good and use it for ourselves? You guys realize that Genesis is the foundational book for the rest of the Bible. Genesis is where we get all of these stories of faith, where we get all of these stories of God working through humanity that other books write about. Other books in this Bible, they refer back to what happened in Genesis because it's, it is the foundation. It's where it all begins. Jesus himself refers back to Abraham, refers back to Adam, refers back to these stories that we've been talking about. We're studying the foundational book. Now we have this picture of Abram, the father of faith, and displaying this trust in God's promises. We need to pay attention to that, right? We need to pay attention to now the story is taking this dramatic turn that we have not seen before. Abram's one of the first people to, in this, in this book of the Bible, one of the first people to actually trust in God's promises. We haven't seen that many examples so far. We've seen a few. We have not seen that many. And Abram is, becomes the father of faith for it. We need to pay attention to that. Even when there was famine around him, even when he was facing all of the consequences of his past decisions, he decides to leave the decisions up to God. How often are we uh, doing that in our own lives? Even in times of peace, even when we are not facing uh, dramatic crises of finances or of anything, even when we're in times of peace, are we allowing God to make our decisions? Are we trusting in God to provide for us? If we're not doing that in times of peace, what happens when chaos comes? What happens when there is something to be worried about? What are we doing then? In my 
relatively short life. Uh, I've taken plenty of opportunities on myself uh, for self-advancement, for uh, self-promotion, or whatever, uh, of taking things for myself and not trusting God's promises, not trusting in God to provide. But I do have uh, one example of probably what I would consider one of the best series of decisions that I've made. I say one of the best. You know, Mariah is included in that decision, and my, my son Ezra is also included in this decision, but I'm not going to be talking about them right now. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the series of my best decisions that I've made uh, came at the end of high school and going into college because I looked around and I realized that I had no passion to do anything. Right? I, I didn't feel a passion inside myself for any uh, sort of career. I didn't know where I was going. I was mad about it, too, because I had all these friends that were passionate about becoming a nurse or a firefighter or going into the military or whatever, and they had these goals, they had these aspirations, they had these desires and passions, and I did not feel the same way. So I was kind of mad about it, and I was praying a lot and talking to God and saying, why, why do I not have any passion for anything? I thought I knew what I wanted to do, and now I realize I don't. I don't know what I want to do. And during that time, God brought back to my memory a lot of things that I had been able to do in, my, in the past. I had gone on several missions trips. During those missions trips, I got to teach a lot uh, from God's word to people who didn't know about him or to people who barely knew about him, and I got to see him work in people's lives. He reminded me of, of Bible studies that I had been a part of and led and um, how I had talked to people about him. And he helped me realize that my passion is for his word. My passion is for him and for relationship with him. And if that's, that's my passion, then that's what I should be throwing myself into, right? And he helped me to realize that this is what I want to do. Being here with you guys, showing people what his word says, learning about it for myself and, and being impacted from it by myself too, that's what I want for my life. And so I decided to go into full-time ministry, but I did not know where to go. I didn't know where to, to study. I didn't know where to begin or how to do that. Um, and so there was a moment there of, okay, I kind of have a direction now, but what's the first step? Where am I supposed to go? I decided to apply for colleges and I really wanted to go to Moody Bible College it's in Chicago. They have a really great um, theology program there. And I wanted to be, excuse me, I wanted to be part of that. I applied to other places as well. I applied to Grand Canyon University. I applied to uh, Liberty, I think, and, and Corbin. I applied lots of different places. And I got to uh, visit a few of those. Um, and what I noticed was that Moody never really got back to me about anything. I, I applied, and they took forever to, to respond. There was a lot of other colleges out there that kind of gave me some feedback, saying, hey, your application's in process. Here's some things to start looking at. There was no communication. No communication from the one place I really wanted to go. And no communication uh, from, from anybody there. And that was kind of interesting to see. I ended up thinking about going to Grand Canyon University as well, because their tuition is insanely cheap, um, it, so I would be able to graduate with no debt at all, which was incredibly appealing to me. And for those of you who, who went to college or, or know how expensive it is, that's really appealing <laughs> to, to be able to leave with no debt. Um, and so I was considering that as well. That was, that was intriguing to me. But what ended up happening was I, I knew that the theology program at Grand Canyon University was not good. Um, their school was... was Christian in name only, really. It's, uh, they, have, they have Christian people there. I have friends who, who go there or who went there, and uh, I know that they trust in the Lord, um, but it's not, it's not the shame, same sentiment shared throughout the entire university, and I, I didn't want that. I wanted a place where everybody was focused on God, and so even though that was appealing, I decided to let it go. And what the school that really came out of the, the blue for me that I wasn't really looking at was Corbin because they got back to me a lot. They communicated with me a lot. And I really appreciated the emphasis they put on, on Christ. And I'm sorry, this kind of seems like a promotional <laughs> talk for, for Corbin, but this is just my story. This is, this is how it, it worked out in my life. And I really appreciated that. I really appreciated that uh, because even though I was so excited to, to go to Moody, uh, that's not where God 
had me go. In the end, I realized that GCU was not the place for me because they didn't have the focus on God that I was looking for. And Moody apparently wasn't the place for me because they waited until late July to, to let me know if I was in or not. And by that time, I'd already been told by lots of other places if I was in or not. Um, and so God was purposefully directing me to Corbin, but I had to wait. I had to wait to, for him to show me where he wanted me to go. And that's hard. <laughs> that's really difficult. But if I did not do that, I would not be where I am today. I would not be here today. I would not be the man I am today because I would not have learned the same things. If I had decided to go for what was easy, if I had decided to, to go for what was in front of me, I would not be in the same place as I, as I am now because of um, how I trusted in God. Luckily, that's, that's one example. You know, I wish I could say I had a whole uh, bucket full of examples where I trusted in God this way. Unfortunately, I don't know if I really do. But God really worked in my life through this time. And it, be, it was because of the example of faith that was set before me through Abraham and through the rest of Scripture. So this is how Abraham reacted in his situation. He went back and looked at what God has done in his past, and he celebrated God, and he worshiped God because of that, and he called out to him for guidance. But he had to wait. He had to wait and see what happened, and he still had stuff to deal with in the meantime. And though this was a great example of faith of him deciding to let Lot choose where to go and let Lot decide and let God provide for him, it was actually really dangerous. If we can go to the, yeah. It was really dangerous. When Genesis was written, it was a long time after this story. Most of these stories that we see in Genesis were passed down orally through generations. And when, by the time this was written, the people uh, who read it and who were able to hear it writ, read to them would have known that this was an incredibly dangerous situation that Abraham just put himself in. Why was it dangerous? There's a few, few reasons why. First of all, he put the covenant in, in jeopardy. He put the covenant seemingly uh, what we would consider in jeopardy because how we consider to uh, you know, make sure that things are safe, make sure that things are right is like uh, if you want something done right, you might as well do it yourself, right? That's, that's what we consider to be, to be appropriate and Abraham let that go. He didn't choose it for himself. He put the covenant in jeopardy that we, we would see as in jeopardy, right? Furthermore, we would see that because of who Lot became to be. Right? He, Lot came and he settled near Sodom, and Sodom was a terribly wicked city, full of dangerous people, full of wicked men, and that ended up being part of his downfall. Right? He ended up investing his life into that city and becoming part of it, and he lost his wife because of it, and he ended up losing a lot because of it. He had to leave the city as God destroyed it. And then what happened after that? He has, a terrible, he has a terrible moment with his daughters who ended up fathering the nations of Moab and Ammon. Moab and Ammon became one of the foremost oppositions to Israel in their attempt to uh, go into the land later on. They, become, they became oppositions to the covenant of God because of this decision, because of Lot's life, because of Abraham's decision to include him as he left his family. There's a lot of stuff to deal with. There's a lot of stuff to, uh, to reconcile with. And uh, the people who were reading this later on who ended up uh, hearing this story of Genesis would have known that. They would see this story as like, wow, that was a really risky move on Abram's part. The final thing to notice about how dangerous it was um, and how great Abram's faith was, and it was a good thing that he decided to leave the providing up to God, was because of the description of the land. It, did you catch it? It says, the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord. What should that bring to mind? Eden, the garden of Eden. And what temptation went there? Eve also, and Adam also, like Lot, as it says, lifted up their eyes and saw that something was desirable. So they took it. 
that was the temptation here. That was the temptation being faced. It was the same temptation that Adam and Eve faced, the same temptation that each one of these people that we read about and that we face as well, that garden temptation, seeing something desirable. Are we going to take it? Abraham decided not to. And he was celebrated because of it. He was counted as righteous because of it. So it was an incredibly dangerous situation that Abraham ended up being in. And of course, he didn't really know these things. He didn't know what Lot's descendants were going to be like. He didn't uh, know that quite the danger that, w- that it was going to be. He didn't know that God was going to end up destroying Sodom. But he, through his faith, God blessed him and enabled him to dodge a really big bullet, didn't he? Because of, if Abraham decided to, to judge things like Lot and take Lot's way of deciding where to go, he would be the one in Sodom, losing everything, having to flee. Maybe God uh, wouldn't have had the same mercies on him as he did on Lot. Who knows? But because of his faith, God protected him and God blessed him. In all this, Abraham still acted by faith. <laughs> Again, what a great example for us. So we ought to live our lives faithfully waiting on God to fulfill his promises and achieve his will. We only have a few minutes left, but let's, let's work through this last part really quickly. Um, we want to know how the story ends. How, how, does this, how does this end? We still haven't heard from the main character. God has still been absent in this story so far. In this chapter, we haven't seen him work. We haven't seen him speak But right now, we're about to see that. Starting in verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. After all the chaos and the appearance of this distress, the author then goes back and reminds us that Abram had very good reason to trust God. Even though the the, the situation was so dangerous, Abram could trust the promise of God. He knew he could because of who God is, because of what God's character is. And how he has proven himself faithful so far. And we see that Abram did in fact make the right decision. And Abram's family would be blessed because of it. And we see where Lot lifted up his own eyes and and saw what was desirable and took it for himself. We see that as Abram waited faithfully for God, then God told him, lift up your eyes and look. God gives to Abram what Lot wanted to take for himself. And not even just the land of Canaan that uh, he agreed, Abram agreed with Lot to take, but you notice what it says, northward and southward and eastward and westward, even including the, lot, the land that Lot just took. <laughs> Abram receives all of it as, as part of the blessing of God. It makes me wonder what kind of blessings do we forfeit What kind of blessings do we forfeit when we refuse to trust the promise of God, when we refuse to trust in God's providence and try to take it on ourselves by living by our own desires and deciding for ourselves what's best? Abram didn't do that. He trusted God. And he here God reiterates his promise to him as he did from chapter 12. And moreover, he adds on to it. Before, God said that he would simply give him land and it would be in his family forever. Uh, that he would make Abram's name great, that Abram will be a blessing to everyone. But now, Abram's offspring will also be as numerous as the dust of the earth. Because of his faith, God adds on more blessing to him, more blessing upon blessing. There will be so many of his offspring that there will be innumerable. The story is just beginning here. We're in the foundation of the Bible. And we see that this, the promise that God has given to Abram has just started to unfold and it will continue to unfold for chapters and chapters and books and books. But if you look, this promise is never quite fulfilled in Genesis or the rest of the Old Testament. We're left waiting to see how is God going to achieve what's happened. The book of Genesis ends with Joseph dying and the people having to go to the land of Egypt because of a famine yet again. 
so they're not in their land anymore. And we see throughout the Old Testament that they're, never, they're made into kind of a great nation, but not the greatest. There's other nations more powerful than them that take them into captivity. We also see that rather than being a blessing to the nation, the nations around the world, Israel's often at odds with all of them. How is this promise then fulfilled? How is this promise fulfilled? In the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus who was the offspring of Abram. The offspring who came and acted upon a greater faith in his life than Abram ever had. And never made the same mistakes. Never made any mistakes. And through that faith, God blessed the entire world. God blessed the entire world with the ability of of grace and salvation through faith. A reconciliation to God that we've been missing and waiting for the entire time. And as our Savior, Jesus not only fulfilled the promise given to Abraham, but he also added on to the promise. He added on to the promise in a very significant way. If we look at the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, I'm just going to read it really quick for you. It says this, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old. As the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Through Jesus, the world is blessed with the gift of grace and salvation, and the world has benefited because of what Jesus left us with. He left us with his spirit to write the law on our hearts and to teach us to know God. He left us with salvation through faith, where he is merciful towards our sins and remembers them no more. Because of Jesus' work on the cross, we have that ability of forgiveness. We have that freedom of forgiveness. And like Abram, we receive the benefits of this this covenant that Jesus mediates with us through faith. We don't receive it by taking it for ourselves. We receive it through faith and believing that what Jesus says about himself is true. What his promise is, is true. So the question we must ask ourselves now is, will our lives be determined by faith? Or by our folly? Will our lives be determined by trusting in God? Or by trusting in our own power? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your